faculty here is unbelievable in terms of their commitment to our students. Good ideas come from everywhere. Beloit students are curious, interesting, always excited about the possibility of learning new things. They're going to dig in and work at what they love and make a positive difference in the world. It pushed me to go beyond what I used to think my academics in college would look like. They're taking these ideas outside the classroom and they're changing how they live. We're in the business of creating human potential. We're here to transform lives. The college is being courageous and adventurous in a lot of the ways that we are dealing with this current moment. We've been intense about restructuring the liberal arts experience around the advanced mentoring program and career channels. Within 72 hours of deciding to be a Beloiter, we're gonna match you with your AMP advisor. And the AMP advisor is the person who's gonna be with you for the first two years. The mentoring program connects faculty with students in the channels program, helps connect their Beloit education to their futures. These two innovations really demonstrate the value of a liberal arts education, preparing students for intellectual and professional agility that will last a lifetime. It's like opening doors so that they see the possibilities, they see how they can make connections. This is a remarkable moment in the history of the world. Everything feels possible. The best institutions rise to moments of challenge and turn themselves into something even better. That's Beloit College right now. At Beloit, you can be anything you want to be. Simply put, Beloit finds a way. Learning at Beloit, I have my hand in a bunch of different things. I'm the head orientation leader, I'm a tour guide trainer, I'm the rush chairman of Sigma Chi, I'm also on the varsity baseball team. All together, everything that I've been doing has been keeping me more accountable and allowing me to sort of work hard, force things, and know that everything isn't just going to be given to me. What I most love about Beloit is the people I encounter all the time. Through all my classes, I work with these people and try to figure out how they think. The students at Beloit College, whatever they're involved in, they really try to give whatever they can to make whatever thing that they're doing better than it was before they impacted it. The professors and staff on campus, they help and encourage you to do more than one thing. If you're involved in a bunch of things and you're constantly looking for ways to engage yourself in the community, you get those connections and those kinds of responses back from other people. I'm an international relations major, German minor. I'm an RA on campus as well as I'm a senior scholar. I'm the vice president senior for Kappa Delta. Yeah, I'm in the track and field team here at the college. I think my favorite part would have to be how many things I get to look at at once because to me, like if I were to look at just political science or just the economic aspect, aspect of international relations, I feel like I'm missing out on other parts of the experience and being able to look at all of these aspects together at various points and how they intersect has been very cool. Beloit, I chose specifically over other colleges because it offers a lot of hands-on experience opportunities that I've kind of used as a triple major to find intersections between my three disciplines. I'm majoring in anthropology, sociology, and class civilizations. All three majors have done a pretty solid job of giving me a path that I can follow this grad. I actually just this past winter break got back from a really incredible opportunity working with the National Park Service in the U.S. Virgin Islands. We were uncovering a big site that was started up in 1998. Really just being able to combine all those different, huge variety of experiences, three majors, a million jobs and projects all the time, into one cohesive study and degree. You know, it's, it's really cool, and I don't think I would have been able to do that anywhere else. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State Line School Districts today. So happy to have you all here for what I think is a, just a wonderful opportunity uh, with, a, with a very special guest that is uh, with us virtually. 
Uh, this is the Roy Chapman Andrews Society DEA School Lecture with uh, this year's honoree, Sarah Parkak. She'll be speaking with you there. She's, she's right there. Um, hi, Sarah. Uh, she'll be speaking with you about the future of exploration, archaeology in 2040 and beyond. Very exciting stuff. We're so lucky to have her here with us this afternoon. And uh, I just want to fill you in a little bit on what's going to happen uh, uh, during, the, during the program. My name is Greg Gerard. I'm executive director of the Beloit International Film Festival and happy to be partnering again on a great uh, event with Roy Chapman Andrews Society. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on the chat room. And if you look in the bottom tray, you'll see a little icon that says chat. So um, at the end of uh, Dr. Parkak's lecture, there's gonna be about a 10 minute window of opportunity for you to, uh, or for some lucky ones of you to have your question asked of uh, Dr. Parkak. So it's important that when you have questions, uh, you go to the chat room, uh, make your comment, chat to everyone, and we will have some, uh, some sharp eyes looking at the questions coming in and try to pick, uh, pick the best questions we can, uh, the best questions that we, well, what we feel are the best questions that are coming in. So that's kind of how it's gonna roll. Before we go any further though, we would like to uh, uh, show you a little clip. Um, it's a uh, sort of a welcome from your leader. Uh, this is Superintendent of Beloit Schools, uh, Daniel Kieser. Roll that clip. Good morning and welcome. Students, families, guests, and our 2021 Distinguished Explorer Award recipient. I'm so excited to see so many smiling faces this morning. I'm Dr. Dan Kieser, Superintendent of the School District of Beloit. The Roy Chapman Andrews Society and the School District of Beloit have a wonderful partnership and collaboration that has enabled our students to meet explorers of the sea, rainforest, deserts, canyons, space, oceans, and so many more. Roy Chapman Andrew is quoted as saying, I wanna go everywhere. I would start on a day's notice to the North Pole or the South Pole, to the jungles or the desert. It made not the slightest difference to me. That's the kind of passion and enthusiasm I want for our students. I want them to wake up and participate in their classes, labs, lessons, and field trips. I want them to be inspired to ask questions, seek out new knowledge, test their hypothesis, and learn about our world. I want them to think and dream beyond now. At this time, I'd like to show, show a short video that highlights the opportunities we have for our students in the School District of Beloit to do just that, dream and think beyond now. When I dream about my future, I'm grateful that my education gave me the foundation to build any life I can imagine. Growing up in the school district of Beloit, my friends and I have had amazing opportunities that other schools don't offer. Teachers provided us with one-on-one -on -one instruction from the beginning, and they encouraged us to dream about what will become in the future. Science, technology, engineering, and math coaches helped our teachers prepare us for our work in intermediate school, high school, and even college. We received iPads starting in kindergarten, and since the school district of Beloit offers dual language immersion, our teachers instructed us in two languages from the beginning. We'll graduate with bi-literacy certification thanks to our inclusive, diverse learning environment, giving us a leg up in any career we choose, anywhere in the world. Intermediate school gave us a challenging science, technology, engineering, and math education that paved the way for us to become the innovators, leaders, and CEOs of the future. Many of us chose an accelerated career path by taking an interest assessment that began our college and career education early through our five specialized academies, giving us a competitive advantage after high school. Our nationally recognized band, orchestra, arts, and drama programming in high school inspires and enriches our creativity, ultimately benefiting whatever occupation we choose. I think all parents want the best life for their kids, and I'm lucky that mine sent me here. After all the opportunities we've had in the school district of Beloit, my friends and I have all the tools we need to succeed in this ever-changing world. Soon, I'll graduate high school with a two-year college degree, and I couldn't be more ready for my future when I'm thinking beyond now.
Thank you. And now I will turn it over to introduce the Distinguished Explorer Award recipient. Hey, Greg. I've, I've seen this happen on national news broadcasts, so I don't feel that bad. But anyway, what I was trying to say was we want to thank the Beloit School District and Dr. Kieser for their thoughts. And we also want to remind you the, the, the other school districts from around the state line area are also uh, uh, participating today. So we want to know that all you school districts are welcome. We're so glad to have you here. We hope you enjoy this opportunity to, uh, to hear Dr. Parkak uh, speak about her work. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce to you the president of the board of directors, Roy Chapman, Andrew Society, Will Anderson. Hey, Will, you're, you're muted. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Although I'm not, I'm not on the screen. It's Carol that's on the screen. Yes. All right. Well, I'm not, I'm not on the video, but uh, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, as Greg just said, my name is Will Anderson, and I've been serving as the for the past year as a president of the Roy Chapman Anderson Society. And Roy Chapman Andrews is probably one of the most famous people to ever come from Beloit. Uh, he was born here in Beloit in 1884. Uh, he lived on St. Lawrence Avenue, not, not far from here, and later graduated from Beloit College. He is best known for his expeditions to the Gobi Desert of Mongolia around the 1920s, some 100 years ago. And he served many years as the director of the American Museum of Natural History. Roy Chapman Andrews was a true celebrity of his day, not only because of his many scientific discoveries, but also because of his ability to spark the imagination of the nation through his writings. I encourage all of you to visit our website to learn more about Roy Chapman Andrews. So the, the mission of our organization, the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, is to inspire scientific discovery by engaging with contemporary explorers who exemplify the legacy of Roy Chapman Andrews, Beloit's native son. So the big question is, of course, who do we as an organization hope to inspire? And I hope it's obvious that at the top of that list are students just like all of you. Uh, each year organization considers the accomplishments of a long list of well-known explorers and the board of directors chooses one who we celebrate by awarding them the Distinguished Explorers Award but a very important part of bringing a famous explorer to Beloit is to inspire all of you to follow in the footsteps of Roy Chapman Andrews and to pursue a career focused on scientific exploration. And I'm still not on the screen. Um, oh, I'm on the screen? Oh, I don't see myself on the screen. All right. So um, in order to make this event happen, uh, it's important to um, uh, acknowledge all the, uh, the organizations and the people that made, made this possible, who provided us funding. And at the top of our list of funders uh, in our category, we, we call the discovery sponsors is ABC Supply, Angus Young Architects and Engineers and Stateline Community Foundation. Uh, at the next year, uh, we have our, our student sponsors, which played a role uh, in sponsoring uh, this student event. And those sponsors include Larry and Karen Arft, Jim and Helen Olson, 
Joe and Don Stottlemyre, Tom and Mim Warren, John and Becky Wong, and the Nice Family Foundation. The next uh, tier we have our, is our Explorer sponsors, which include, again, Angus Young Architects Engineers, Amy Lokrantz, Western Container, and Paul Wheelis. Um, and then uh, equally as important is our partnering sponsors, which provide uh, in-kind support, which includes the Ironworks Hotel, Resonate Web Marketing, Beloit College, the School District of Beloit, Beloit International Film Festival, Greg Gerard and Kristen uh, Kazubowski. And then I also have a very long list of patron sponsors, but that list is a little bit too long. Uh, and so I'm gonna uh, keep us moving along uh, so we don't take up too much time. So I'd like to uh, next introduce our speaker. Uh, this year, the Roy Chapman Andrews Board of Directors is awarding the Distinguished Explorers Award to Dr. Sarah Parkak. Uh, she can be described in many different ways. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, she's an Egyptologist. Uh, she's the founding director of the Laboratory for Global Observation. Uh, she's the recipient of the 2006 TED Prize. Uh, and she's the 2016 recipient of the Smithsonian Magazine's American Ingenuity Award in the history category. But I think my absolute favorite of her titles is Space Archaeologist. What a, what a cool title, Space Archaeologist. Um, she uses a combination of satellite imaging analysis and surface surveys to search for potential archaeological sites and has been credited with finding many very significant sites. And if any of you are interested, I think you'll enjoy watching her interview uh, with Stephen Colbert on The Late Show. That uh, video clip is on our website, but also can be found on YouTube. Or you also might enjoy uh, watching one, uh, her TED talk uh, about ar archaeology from space. Um, and uh, just a little plug for tonight, uh, again, Dr. Parkak will be presenting a lecture this evening. The program starts at 6, um, uh, but the, it really kicks off at 6.30. And her lecture will be entitled, Toward an Inclusive Future of the Past, How to Make Archaeology for Everyone. And you can join in the event tonight by going to our website. Uh, that website uh, URL is RoyChapmanAndrewsSociety.org, and you can click on a link that you'll see on our page. But this afternoon, Dr. Parkak is here with you, and just remember, if any of you have any questions, you can submit them through the chat box. Uh, we'll be monitoring those questions, and we'll be uh, uh, providing them to Dr. Parkak uh, near the end of her, of her uh, lecture. So if you all will please uh, give Dr. Parkak a very warm Beloit welcome. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first of all, thank you so very much to the um, to the Roy Chapman Andrews Society for this extraordinary uh, and unexpected honor. When I saw the email in my inbox, I forget when pandemic, what is time anymore? Um, you know, I had to take a moment. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about my connection to um, to, to Roy Chapman Andrews. Um, the, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I know a lot of you out there in, in Beloit and surrounding communities, you know, when people, um, I, I, always, I, I always kind of have to catch a famous explorer, are they talking about me, are you sure about that? Um, I'm, I'm mostly a tired, a tired mom these days, we have, a, we have an eight year old. Um, but, you know, I, I, you, you see these people, whether they're on television or they're giving you lectures, you see them online, and it's hard to kind of imagine yourself um, as that person. And here's the thing that I bet you don't know about me. I am from a town called Bangor, Maine, uh, that is exactly the same size, uh, population-wise, size-wise, as Beloit. I grew up, my childhood was probably pretty much identical to all of yours. Uh, I bet Beloit, you know, from everything I've, I've seen online, it's one of these wonderful communities um, even though it's 2021, it, you know, it could be 50, 60 years ago. Um, it preserves that old, old timiness of, of America. You know, I grew up playing Little League. I rode my bike around town. Um, so I grew up in a pretty small town, um, just, just like Beloit. I say this because it's hard when you're in grade school or middle school or in high school, um, especially when you, when you grow up in a smaller town, um, to imagine yourselves out in the world exploring 
and discovering things and whatever it is you've been dreaming of doing, whether it's being an astronaut or a scientist or an engineer or a writer. Um, but I'm telling you, you know, I, I, I was you um, 23, 24 years ago, you know, that was me. And so I just want to tell all of you, you know, first of all, from, from hearing from your, your superintendent and from everything I've heard, you know, you're coming from a place with, with an extraordinary school system. You have all the tools you need to go on and achieve whatever it is you want to do. You know, I dreamt of being an Egyptologist um, ever since I was a small girl. And if you don't believe that I was once a small girl, so my first slide, let me um, go to share screen. And here we go. Here is, uh, here is proof that I was once a very little girl. Uh, so this is in Maine. This was probably circa 1985, 84, 85. I was probably about um, six years old. Uh, here I am with my brother, uh, Aaron, who's a cute, cute cherubic little little boy uh, who looks exactly like our son, uh, with my grandfather. I'll talk to you a little bit about um, my grandfather, Harold Young, in a few seconds and his influence on my life. Uh, but I grew up in the woods. I am very proud of, of my heritage, of, of where I, I grew up, um, and you know that helped to, to form me as a scientist and as, as a person. So again, just to emphasize, you know, I we have a lot in common. Um, and I'm telling you, you, you can go out there and, and do what you want. Um, so I'm talk to you a little bit about my connection to, to, to Roy Chapman Andrews and why this award is so incredibly special to me and such an enormous honor. Um, so I was an undergrad at Yale University, uh, graduated in 2001, and I got to spend about a year and a half working in the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, in their basement collections. And I got to look at a lot of amazing archeological material from salvage um, expeditions and excavations that happened in um, modern day Sudan, ancient Nubia uh, in the 1960s. And in the basement of the Yale Peabody Museum, uh, right above the door was um, a series of pictures of Roy Chapman Andrews that were pretty much, I think, I wanna say this, it, this was one of them for sure. So at first I, I looked at this picture, who is this person? Why, you know, why are we seeing pictures, black and white pictures of, of this guy in a strange hat? Um, and of course I asked and I was told that oh, it's Roy Chapman Andrews, um, you know, kind of great, great, great paleontologist, great explorer. And at Yale in the Peabody Museum, we not only had Egyptology material, but of course we had a great um, paleontology collection. So, um, so I, I essentially was formed as a scholar and a scientist uh, being inspired by, by Roy Chapman Andrews. And of course I've, I've read his books, his um, read about his life. So he's been with me um, for, for over 20 years. So uh, you never know, you absolutely never know when the, the people you read about and, and look up to are going to come back in, into your life. And I have to tell you uh, this, this award, which is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, it was such a treat to get it in the mail. It's now sitting on our son's desk. So um, um, I, I'm really glad <laughs> he can appreciate it as well. He loves he loves exploration. So um, you know, that's the thing too, that's been kind of kind of amazing. Um, being a mom, you, know, you get to experience everything through the eyes of your children. And, um, you know, everyone is born an explorer. I, I heard that. And I kind of believed it until we had a child. And then I saw with my own eyes, we are all born explorers because the only thing you need to explore are your eyes, right? To, to look and see, and you're not even, you just to, to feel, to touch, to sense the world around you. And that's innate in all of us. And I think we need to do more to, um, to encourage that sense of, of uh, design, desire to explore. You know, if only we could all keep that great sense of wonder about the world, um, I think that would help so much with so many of the great challenges that we're facing today as, as a society and as a world. And I'll talk to you about some of those challenges too, some stuff that, that I want you to consider. The other thing I want you to think about, you know, I know you're going to see a lot today um, about work I've done, about, about work my colleagues have done. And I know oftentimes when you see all this great work um, done by scientists and explorers, you may think, well, gosh, they're, they're finding all of these incredible sites and, and new species and new places they're traveling, there'll be nothing left by the time I'm ready. And here is a secret. And you can tell everybody or, or, or nobody, it's up to you, it's a secret. Uh, we are entering, I think, the most exciting golden age of exploration in history. The scale of the technologies, 
um, that are being used, what's available to the public, things like citizen archaeology, which I'll talk about with you today, you know, a way for all of you to participate in exploration. It's just ushering in our ability to discover tens of thousands of archaeological sites around the world. And it's not just about finding the sites, it's about going and visiting them and exploring them and mapping them and collecting all the information, which I'll talk to you about today. So don't feel for a second that, you know, we're, you're, you're behind, you're uh, being left out, that there'll be nothing left for you to do. In fact, there's going to be so much for you to do. I can't even, I can't even describe the level of the work that there will be for you to do. And that's why I titled my talk today, our archaeology in 2040 and, and beyond, you know, by the time all of you are getting to that midpoint in your careers in your late 30s to early 40s in the 2040s, um, with all the challenges we're facing and all that's at stake in, in our world, the work that you do is actually going to be much, much more important than the work I'm doing. I'm going to be winding down around this, the time that you're all, you're all ramping up no matter what you're doing. Uh, you know, if you had told me when I was in middle school or in high school, that there would be this whole field where you could use satellite images to map ancient archaeological sites, I would have said, that's, that's, that's like from one of the science fiction books that I like to read. How would you do that? That's impossible. Um, you know, I graduated from high school in 1997. And, um, you know, I, I challenge, I'm planning all this in your heads because I want you to think about all the great science, science fiction movies that you've watched and all of the great sci-fi and fantasy novels that you've read or, or hopefully are reading, because there are whole worlds that have been imagined that are in the process of being created right now. In other words, we cannot, we can barely comprehend the future that's coming. You know, could you have imagined that our whole world was going to be contained? Can't really see my, my iPhone, right? Trying to, I'm trying to hold it up. There we go. Yeah, our whole, our whole planet, most of the information from our whole world, we hold in our pockets now. Uh, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary what's possible. And this is only the beginning of what's coming. And that's your generation. So again, don't feel for a second like you're behind or you're missing out. This is only the start. And I want you to take what I share with you today and my hope, no matter what any, any of you end up doing, whether it's something in the arts or, or your writers or your scientists or your archaeologists or your astronauts, it just doesn't matter what you do. But the idea is that there is so much out there for you to do and so much that is going to be essential for you to do, um, given where we are as a world and given, given where we're going. And I'll talk to you a little bit about um, the greatest inspiration of, of my life. And that is my grandfather. So the person you saw in the first slide, um, Harold Young, he was a forestry professor at the University of Maine in Ornell. And he was one of the pioneers in using aerial photographs, it's a field called aerial photogrammetry, uh, for forestry. So you see what he's looking through right now is called a stereoscope. So it's, a, it's basically like a, 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 a um, sort of like binoculars meets microscope and you stare through uh, at the top and you put two overlapping um, aerial photos, one on top of the other, and you can end up seeing them in 3D. And he would use this to measure the, the tree heights and to calculate um, the types of species. Um, so he did what I do. Um, separated by about 60 years. Unfortunately, my, you know, my grandfather passed away before I really started getting into um, the work that I do. But he's the reason I took my first remote sensing course as an undergraduate. Um, so I say this to all of you because you have no idea who the people are in, in your worlds, in your lives, that will ultimately end up inspiring you, whether they're your parents, your grandparents, or a family friend, or someone in the community. And, and as and when you do get to college, the, the only college advice, uh, I get asked a lot for college advice, and I'm careful because it's really important. The only college advice I'll give is that it is completely, um, it is essential that you take that one college course for that one subject that you've been interested in ever since you were a little kid, whether it's about bugs or weather or outer space or anthropology, it doesn't matter. Allow yourself the freedom, especially in your first year, maybe your second year, to take that one class, that one thing that maybe your parents told you, oh, don't, you don't want to waste your time studying that, or oh, you love bugs since you were a kid. Oh, no one's going to hire you to study bugs. Take the course. Worst case scenario, you'll have a great time. You'll learn about something you've always wanted to learn about, um, or you'll end up with a double major, or you'll end up with a whole life that you didn't expect. That is, that is the only college advice I will give, and it's really important. So what I want to share with you today, I want to frame you to all of you kind of where we are as a field. 
uh, in, in archaeology and, and kind of the big things that are at stake and some things you may have seen about in the news. And to provide some context for you before I get into um, the scale of what's out there and what's left to find. Um, so we are coming up on the 100th anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Um, it will be October, November of uh, 2022, so in a year and a half. You see Howard Carter um, staring, staring in one of the four shrines of King Tut. Uh, over his shoulder, the man with a mustache uh, is Lord Carnarvon, the gentleman who um, helped to fund the expedition. But there's a third person in the picture. This is a really famous picture. I think it was published in National Geographic magazine, probably on the front cover of the New York Times. There is an Egyptian gentleman uh, in classic Egyptian dress wearing what's known as a galabea, so the long kind of flowing robe outfit um, that you definitely want to wear when you're in Egypt. It's, it's so hot and a, and a kind of classic head, head turban. Who is he? What was his name? Is it Mahmoud? Is it Muhammad? Is it Saeed? Um, he's faceless. He's nameless. And I like to show this photo to frame the context of who gets left out of the story. Because I guarantee you, he's in the room with Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. He's probably their reis, R-E-I-S. That's Egyptian Arabic for foreman or headman. Um, it's the most important person on an archaeological expedition. It's your kind of your chief operating officer. It's the person that's, that helps you to manage the workforce and the money. Um, they usually speak pretty good English. Um, they, um, you know, they're very smart. They're very clever. They've been around archaeology their whole lives. More often than not, they are fully qualified archaeologists. They, in fact, they can probably dig better than a lot of foreigners. And yet, who was he? So I want to frame this in the sense of we're having all these conversations around the world about who matters right now. You know, all these stories that have been left out uh, about indigenous peoples, about um, uh, who gets credit for discoveries. And I promise you, this person, whoever it was, was just as important, if not more important, than Howard Carter, because he was the person that organized the workforce. He's the one that made the work possible. So I always want you to ask when you are um, looking at these pictures, when you're seeing stories on TV, ask yourself who's getting credit, who should get credit, and who is giving credit. You know, if archaeologists are talking about their discoveries, um, no, it's a team effort. You know, I don't like saying my discoveries. It makes me very uncomfortable. It's rare. It's really rare in archaeology that one person will make one discovery. In fact, it's, it's that way for science as a whole, right? I work with a great team of collaborators. They are our discoveries. Um, you know, in my, in, my, in my lab, at my not-for-profit, um, you know, I work with a team of people. So, so very, it's very rare that I will find a single thing, so that there's this myth around the sole discoverer. Um, so again, I want you to kind of framing this idea of, of where we are as a society, of where we're moving. You know, we are now, I think, as a society, doing a better job of acknowledging collaboration. Um, who are your partners? Who should get credit? Because ultimately, it doesn't matter who found something. It's that something gets found. It's something gets shared. And people get excited about it. To me, that's what matters. And that's what I want you to walk away from today, understanding. I want to talk to you about some pretty cool discoveries um, that have been made by, um, uh, by my colleagues at the Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt. And I'll, I'll talk tonight. I don't think I have time today to talk to you about... Um, my specific work in Egypt, although I'll talk to you a little bit about my work in Egypt, but tune in tonight. Um, the lecture I'll be giving this evening is almost completely different than the talk I'm giving right now. Uh, look, tiny, tiny little bit of overlap, but they're completely different talks. So there's a discovery made, I think it was about last fall. So here you have um, the site or the region of Luxor, Egypt, one of these amazing places I hope you all get to go someday. And you have the East Bank, you have um, Luxor and Karnak temples, and on the West Bank, of course, the famous Valley of the Kings, the Colossi of Memnon, all these amazing and great temples. And uh, this was a discovery made of dozens of absolutely stunning mummies found by my colleagues at the ministry. Um, and they're just, they're just the most beautifully painted. Um, these are the mummies just as they've come out of the ground. Uh, here you see the ministry, Dr. Khaled El Anani, um, looking at them sort of stacked one on top of the other. So you've probably seen a lot in the news recently about all of these amazing discoveries in Egypt. You know, there's just a new settlement found in, uh, in Luxor. There are new cemeteries coming up all the time. In fact, there's a great uh, uh, documentary that I think is, is perfectly fine for all of you to watch on Netflix. Um, it's called Secrets of the Saqqara Sands, and it's about the discovery of a tomb dating to Egypt's old kingdom, so roughly 
4,500 years ago. It's one of the top streaming documentaries in the in the U.S. And it's, I mean, our our eight-year-old has watched it. It's completely, completely fine. Um, so I recommend it if you want to get a sense of what, what it's actually like to dig in Egypt. Uh, and then to show you just the quality of the, um, the paintings, all of these amazing things are out there to be found. Now, it's not just about, uh, it's not just about tombs, right? We're interested in daily life in ancient Egypt. And you'll see that theme again and again in my talk uh, today, or both my talks today. You know, it's not just about uh, what you find, it's what you find out. It's these big questions that you can ask uh, about the data that you're looking at. Who are these people? How did they live their lives? How did they build these places? What made it possible? Um, you know, that information is, is what drives me as an archaeologist, as an explorer, as a scientist. Um, finding something's cool. Don't get me wrong. I love digging. I love finding things. But, but it's the big picture that you can kind of weave together um, that's, that's the important thing. And I think what hopefully helps to captivate people as they're learning more and more about the past. So this discovery was made near the Valley of the Kings. So we have that right here. Uh, and, he, and it's in this area, the Valley of the Monkeys. So if you're to visit the Valley of the Kings, um, you drive in, you know, it's this area up here. There are dozens of tombs that you can visit. But this is a discovery made uh, by a, a friend of mine, uh, Fifi Rohima Fifi, um, a little over a year ago. Uh, my husband and I and, and son and our friends got to visit Egypt and, and visit this discovery. And it was a new workman's village. So in other words, this is a place where uh, the people who helped to build the amazing tombs like King Tut's tomb in the Valley of the Kings, um, roughly 2,400, 2,500 years ago, uh, this is one of the places they lived, or at least they stayed and, and while they helped to uh, dig up the tombs and dig out the tombs and paint them and, and bring uh, decorations for them. Really extraordinary discovery. So all of these amazing pots and decorated finance beads and amulets, quite amazing. So this is, this is a place where they were making these things in workshops before they were used to put on coffins and, and to decorate the tombs. Um, and I say this is important because it's the, only the second workman's village to ever be discovered in the history of Egyptology. And this is something that was found a year ago. The only other workman's village we know about is a place called Beryl Medina. It's located on the West Bank, not that far from the Valley of the Kings. It's a short walk away. Uh, and this is about 100 homes. So these are the, the men and women and the families who built the Valley of the Kings or, or were responsible for the construction of the Valley of the Kings. Uh, they, um, uh, they lived in families. Uh, it was kind of a secluded place. Um, we have the foundations of all of the places they lived, all the homes. So again, you know, this is a, the, the scale of what was found in the Valley of, Valley of the Monkeys by my Egyptian colleague, it's smaller, but again, it helps to reveal this picture of daily life. This is what it looked like reconstructed. So I wanna dive in right now into this, this wild world of space archeology. span What is space archeology? span It sounds like something out of a science fiction book or movie, and it's not, it's real. It basically means that the use of, of, of high resolution satellite images, uh, drones, any kind of aerial data that's used to uh, map archeological sites. Now, the work that I use is called optical remote sensing data. What does that mean? Well, in other words, it's image, you think of like, think of like a high-tech Google Earth, right? That allows you to process imagery and show in information in a different part of the light spectrum that we can't see with our human eyes called the infrared. So almost like a space-based CAT scan that allows you to see subtle differences in soil and vegetation and water differences that makes those features on the archeological sites pop. Well, that's all well and good if you're working in a place like Egypt, which of course is the desert, right? Or, or, or um, large multi-period archeological sites, but it's entirely different when you are looking at the rainforest. I can't see through trees with satellites. It's okay to say the word can't. There's some things you can't do in science, but there is a technology that can. It's called LIDAR. LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. So it's a laser mapping system that you fly in an airplane or a helicopter. And what it does is it shoots down hundreds of thousands, millions of pulse beams of light that hit the tops of vegetation and the middle of the vegetation and the floor of the rainforest. And you can strip that vegetation away and see what's beneath. So this is work done by my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Damien Evans um, at the amazing site of, of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. So this is the Khmer civilization. So that's K-H-M-E-R. Definitely read about them. They were extraordinary. Um, they're a civilization that lasted uh, around a thousand years ago. Um, and there are they're dozens and dozens and dozens of temples, not hundreds of these amazing, amazing temples. But the temples are only a small part of what's there. 
uh, you have these massive complexes, these walled settlements that are surrounding them, and you can see the before and after. You can't see anything here, but here you see all of these mounds, which are the settlements where the priests who lived and worked in these temples lived. So that's just one example. And I mentioned before infrared. Um, so this is one example uh, done by my colleagues uh, in Venice at the, at the uh, Roman city of Altinium, and you see the before and after the after. So much more shows up when you look at different parts of the light spectrum. And the reason is because our human eyes can only process visible data. We can't see in the near, middle, or far infrared. But satellites can, and so you take pictures, and vegetation actually reflects much, much more strongly in the um, visible part, or, or in, the, in the near infrared part of the light spectrum. So that's why we can see it better. And just one example, this is just visual information. So this is one archeological site in the Eastern Egyptian Delta. Um, and you can see just visually, just from the differences in the slightly buried um, uh, foundations of the buildings, we're gonna zoom in a little bit, we can see almost the complete outline of this Roman period city. So this is a city that's almost 2000 years old. So with almost no processing whatsoever, you can very clearly see houses, streets, potential administrative buildings, maybe that's a temple and entire neighborhoods. That's the power of this technology. And of course, um, you know, thinking about how we apply this at scale and how we're going to apply this at scale speaking at 20, speaking of 2040, this is work uh, done by my, my colleagues of uh, uh, Francisco Estrada Belli and Marcelo Canuto of Tulane University, uh, mapping the um, archeological sites and regions of Central America and the Maya. They have mapped um, thousands of square kilometers of, of, of um, archaeological sites that are almost completely buried beneath the rainforests, and they have found thousands upon thousands of ancient features. So it's not just a question anymore of what are you going to find? What are you going to do when you have all the data for an entire civilization? What will we do when we have hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, millions of square kilometers of data that covers the entirety of the Maya world? That is where we're going to be, and not by 2040, by the way, within the next decade. How will we cope with the information from all across the world? That's a, as, 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 a, as we like to tell our son, that's a you problem, that's not a me problem. Um, that's that's gonna be something that your generation is gonna have to help parse through. Cause right now we can't keep up with all this data that's coming out. It's, it's, it's too much, which is why we need crowdsourcing more on that a little bit. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, kind of what our son has, has taught me. So I, I never show pictures of his, his face publicly um, for, for reasons of privacy, but we'll show them from behind. And what, what, one of the amazing things that, that happened, uh, so this is the archeological site of Licht where I co-direct the project with Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities. And um, one of the really cool things that happened the first time that we took our son to Egypt, he was four years old. Uh, you know, four-year-olds aren't very big. They're, they're little, little, little girls and guys. And what you have to do, because they're, they're down, they kind of come up to, you know, just about your, your belly button, you've got to crouch down to get to where they are to talk to them. And it was the first time that we looked up. We're always busy looking or looking up differently, but when you get down and you look up, you see things differently. And so our son helped us to see a completely different side of Egypt that we were, were not expecting. So again, this whole idea of kids being natural explorers, kids pointing things out, kids make you look differently uh, and they make you think differently and they make you take a lot less for, for granted. Um, and I mentioned, I, this is a very glitzy, glamorous picture of, of, of me from about 10 years ago. Um, and it's a documentary I did, I think it's on YouTube called Rome's Lost Empire. Um, but while I filmed the show, I was pregnant. And I talk a lot about being a mom. I talk a lot about um, having kids because I think that explorers and how explorers look are very different now. You know, you saw that picture of Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon, um, older white male, uh, but the the diversity of explorers is is uh, increasing. You know, there it's the whole. If you can see it, you can be it. Um, and the idea, you know, it's 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 fine. It's fine to be pregnant in the field. It's fine to be a mom. It's fine, um, you know, to to embrace who you are. Uh, we're we're full humans. Um, this is all really 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 important. Um, so you know, ultimately we've you know we've got to um, you know acknowledge that that we need to inspire 
the world in a much, much different and a much better way. Um, and hopefully get all of you to realize that you, know, you too can, can do this. So I want to tell you a little bit about my work. Hopefully I'll have, um, I've got plenty of time. Um, so this is the story. If you have seen the second, um, sorry, the first Indiana Jones. So this is the story of Tanis, Egypt's capital from around 1000 uh, BC. So it was Egypt's capital for roughly uh, 400 years. This massive, massive capital. And we just didn't know very much about the city itself. A French excavation team had excavated the northern part of the site, excuse me, um, in the early, to, uh, around the 1920s to 1930s. Uh, but in using satellite imagery, what we were able to do is map the full extent. So this is a before image. And we're going to see the after. So we are going to see the outlines of countless structures across the whole site. So I, I should like to show this image because when I tell people we can find things using satellite imagery, you know, it's not just, you know, a bunch of blobs and I promise you there's a thing. I mean, you can see the clear and distinct map that Tanis used to be. Um, and again, we're taking all this information, we're looking at different phases of construction of the site, we're looking at um, how it was built, we're looking at um, who lived there, we're looking at, at um, how the city evolved over time. Again, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. Uh, oh yes, and of course, uh, any anytime you can punch a Nazi, it's a good thing. Um, so a lot of you may have seen the new Wonder Woman movie, well, it's a couple of years old now, um, with, with Wonder Woman played by Gal Gadot. And one of the cool things that we, my world all geeked out about, um, she is a curator of kind of classics and the ancient Near East in the Louvre. So she has all these objects and artifacts behind her. This representation matters. You know, whether she's a curator, whether she's an archeologist, clear she grew up in Themyscira. Um, she's, she, you know, she loves the past um, and that's important. And what's equally important, of course, um, are representations from movies like Black Panther. Um, so in this particular scene, one of my favorite Marvel movies here, you have the Killmonger looking at this, um, this, this hammer, this ax that was taken from Wakanda. You know, as you know, we're having lots of conversations now about representation and who owns the past. And he goes in and he takes the hammer uh, because he says it doesn't belong to you anymore. And we're, th this, this is informing, this is, kind of inspiring a lot of conversations we're having right now, a lot of difficult conversations museums are having about this idea of repatriation. Repatriation means to take things and to return them back to their rightful owners. Should museums have objects and artifacts that are um, that belong to, that were taken from cultures where there are indigenous peoples today, or maybe they were not taken, uh, they, they were not taken in a legal way. So again, these are big conversations we're having right now, big debates that we're having. Um, you know, I encourage you to look, look, look up this stuff online, but again, it's, it's, it's informed from, um, it both informs and is informed from conversations we're having in popular culture. And this is stuff that's gonna be important for the next hundred years. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about how we go from satellite imagery to excavation. How do we do that? And is it important? You know, a lot of people think, oh, you don't, you don't dig in the ground. You don't, you know, you just find stuff. No, 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 no. I like to get dirty. I like to, to, to dig in the ground. Um, I am, I am a fully trained archaeologist. It's my favorite thing to do in the whole world. Um, so what I want to share with you today, it's another archaeological site in the Eastern Egyptian Delta called Tel Tavila. Um, so it's up here. So it's about a two and a half hour uh, drive north of Cairo. Um, so here you see Tel Tavila. And it was uh, Egypt's, uh, it was a city in Egypt roughly 2,600 years ago. So you see, of course, um, what the city, what, what it looks like today. And it doesn't look like much, it's a large, it's a brown mound, multiple layers of occupation, one on top of the other. Um, so this is a really important city along the branch of the Nile. Um, it's ancient Egyptian name, you see here along the Mendesian branch um, was Ronefer. Ronefer means the beautiful mouth. So it was a really nice name for a town. It was called the Beautiful Mouth because it literally was on the mouth of the Mendesian branch from the Nile, of the Nile. And, and, and the Nile divvied up into seven branches as it hit the Delta. And so what would happen is trading boats would come in from all over the Mediterranean bearing fine goods, fine linens and jewelry and perfumes. And they'd stop at Tel Tavila and trade. It's a really important trading center. So uh, we knew that the city of Tel Tavila had a temple 
but we didn't we kind of knew where it was, but we really didn't know a lot of information. And so this is a 1968 spy photograph. Um, so the, there's a really cool US um, program called the Corona program. So a lot of, kind of during the Cold War in the 1960s, the US sent up spy planes to take pictures of lots of the world. And these black and white um, old photos turned out to be really, really important because in so many places in the world, the landscapes have changed radically, you know, with, with urbanization, with development. Um, and a lot of these landscapes are gone. So this information from 50, 60 years ago uh, is really important for us to, uh, because it preserves what these landscapes look like. And I want you to look. So we know the temple was located up here. You can kind of see it. I want you to look at here, this really interesting rectilinear feature that shows up and it's pretty clear. So we decided we were going to dig. And that's the old topographic map. We did um, what was known as magnetometer survey work. So work looking beneath the ground and we kind of missed it. So we have to use different kinds of technology. And here is what we found. So this is in 2003. Um, so it was roughly 280 meters by 180 meters in size. Um, this massive mud brick wall, 11 meters across. You can actually see this really cool, almost medieval style buttressing. Um, and there it is, right? You, we found it from space and we dug it up, but that's not the whole story. That's only the beginning of the conversation. So here we see the hypothetical uh, temple size, pretty big, um, pretty big enclosure. And what's, what's amazing is these temple enclosure areas, they're almost like economic engines for the town. So this is where trade would come in. The priest would be living there. People would come to worship. Really, really, really important for the, um, for the economic development of ancient Egypt. Here's the story. Corners in ancient Egypt are interesting places. You can quote me on that. Um, so we decided we were going to excavate in the corner of this one, you know, one corner of the, the uh, enclosure wall that you saw from space. And I found this uh, dense, bricky um, conglomeration. It was really weird. It was, it was like someone had taken a bunch of bricks from a building and thrown them in the corner. And it went from the very top of this mud brick all kind of cascading down. It's all very confusing. You can kind of see a little bit here. So here I am digging through it. You see how red it is. And all of these amazing objects started coming out of the ground. So these bits of lapis, little pieces of gold, um, these bronze blobs. It didn't look like anything. But in art, it's archaeology, so you map things very carefully. You, you preserve their locations in 3D. You um, record everything. That's important. And these are the things we ended up finding. So these, after the conservator used them. So in ancient Egypt, here's the story, it was so cool. So the temple of Teltabilla um, would have had in it a holy of holies. So think if you go to church or synagogue or, or a temple or you've seen inside a religious building, you know, you have either the altar where the cross is placed or if you're a Hindu, you know, in India, the holy of holies is where the, the idols or, or the shrines are placed where you worship the gods and goddesses. Well, the same thing for ancient Egypt. The insides of the temples would have contained shrines for the principal gods and goddesses of the temples. Typically in ancient Egypt, you have a temple that's dedicated to a specific god, uh, but there, but there, 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 there's the kind of the mother, the father, and the child. So Isis, Horus, and um, or, or Isis, Osiris, and Horus, and this the fittings for these um, gold encrusted, you know, or, or gold foil, these, these statues, statuettes, they would have been held in the temple. And we know that the Persian leader Artaxerxes III in 343 BC sailed down the Nile. And he attacked the temple at Ronefer. We know this because of Herodotus and it's attested elsewhere. And what we think happened is the soldiers went into the temple after they kind of took it over. They took the idols, the most sacred parts of the site or the temple, they took them in the corner and they set them on fire. And that's why we found bits of gold, and that's why we found the fittings that would have originally been in these idols. So it's not that we found a temple wall, and it's not that we excavated, it's that we had confirmation of a really interesting piece of history. And we discovered it through excavation that was guided by the work using remote sensing. So again, like I said before, it's not about what you find, it's what you find out, and it's about putting all these pieces together that allow you to paint a much richer picture of what happened in the past. So I want to kind of back up a little bit and talk to you about kind of what's at stake and why I do what I do and hopefully why we can get your help. Um, 
you know, paranormal beliefs are, uh, or belief in the paranormal is just skyrocketing right now. You know, belief in aliens, belief um, in, in um, you know, the Bigfoot is real and people can move objects with their minds. And I bring this up, this may be a little controversial, but I, I hope it isn't, uh, because there is a really big anti-science movement that is running um, not just in the US, but around the world and it's informing um, big conversations we're having right now about the efficacy of vaccines. In other words, it's not just about aliens. It's not just about paranormal and Bigfoot. All these big conversations, you know, shows like ancient aliens cause enormous harm to us today. If everyone in this country were to get vaccinated, that could, the pandemic would be over. You would all be back in school. Everyone would be back at work. We would be back to normal in a few months, but we're not. And this is going to be a long and difficult road ahead of us. So I mentioned this because all of these things are harmful and they're racist and they hurt people. So, you know, again, it's not just about archaeology, right? Archaeology informs much bigger conversations and it's a door, it's a gateway um, to, to people who don't believe in science. Um, science is true whether you believe in it or not. You know, you don't have to believe in gravity. It's a fact. And I, and I bring this up because these, these beliefs are changing, they're shifting. You know, in, in 2016, 27% of people in this country believed that aliens had visited Earth in our ancient past. In 2018, we're up to 40%, and I would bet that number is even higher now. So we've got a big fight against us. Now, again, I don't wanna, you know, take away your beliefs, your beliefs, um, but, but, you know, I, and I firmly, by the way, I firmly believe on life on other planets. I believe that out there in, in the universe and the multiverse, um, there are other civilizations. I just, we have zero proof that any of them ever visited earth. Um, you know, all these extraordinary ancient civilizations, they were invented and created and imagined by extraordinary indigenous peoples who are every bit as creative as we are today. That is our real human heritage. To me, that gives me great hope. And it should give you that hope too. You know, again, this is all informing difficult conversations we're having you know, about um, about the rise of white nationalism in the U.S. And I bring this up because for those of you that saw images from the um, January sixth uh, insurrection at our nation's capital, um, there were a lot of symbols that were co-opted by um, the terrorists, by the people who invaded the capital um, from the classical world. And from the Viking world, that crazy guy with the helmet um, from indigenous peoples. Again, these symbols, these concepts, these ideologies are, are, are a part of this much bigger, very difficult conversation and, and really complicated place we are as a country right now. And archaeologists didn't work fast enough or hard enough to speak out against it. So all these symbols, all these concepts, all these ideas, they've been co-opted by groups that are harming our country. Um, and I bring all this up to you and I talk about this, this archaeology of 2040 because I am so hopeful, I am so inspired by my extraordinary students um, that, I, that I see in, in, in my classes at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and my, my colleagues are too. You know, the students are coming in with such compassion, such empathy, such openness, um, such love for our, and, and a willingness to celebrate the extraordinary diversity of our country and our world. And that's all on you, by the way, that's you. That is your generation. Your generation is inspiring my generation. It's inspiring older generations because of your openness and because of your willingness to be more accepting. Um, and, and that's helping to inform me with the work that I'm doing. And I think that's the lesson that archeology span teaches us, right? Archeology span should be about a celebration of the human spirit, of the human capacity to create, of creativity. That is the real message of archeology. span And you know, the ancient world wasn't black and white, right? It was this amazing and colorful place. You hear, just you see all these, these white statues from the classical world or from ancient Egypt and they were all brightly painted. They were all brightly colored. Um, so again, we, we're not seeing the world as, as it should be. We're also kind of at a crossing point right now, you know, with climate change. Um, climate change and controversies around the world and, and, and governments that aren't adequately funding um, cultural heritage, uh, museums are burning. You know, we have the museum in Brazil. We just had a, a major collection in South Africa in Johannesburg uh, burn. Uh, and, and museums, by the way, this is not a problem in other places. This is a problem in our country too. 
Museums are affected by fire. Museums are affected by flooding. So all this work around um, this urgency around climate change, it's not just about rising sea levels. It's about all of our heritage around the world that's going to be impacted. So I want to talk to you a little bit in the few minutes I have left, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions um, about why I do what I do. So I believe but the core of my being is, you know, I believe archaeology should be for everyone. It shouldn't just be for, for people who have degrees. Um, we should make archaeology as accessible as possible. And that's why I founded Global Explorer. So we're a 501c3, we're not for profit, based in Birmingham, Alabama. And we uh, believe in using diverse technologies to help map um, cultural treasures around the world, to help empower governments and cultural heritage organizations to, um, you know, to, to to give them the tools they need to be able to map and protect their heritage and protect it for the future. So I started this about um, four or five years ago through money from the TED Prize. Um, so we started with Peru. So we created an online citizen archaeology platform that allowed anyone in the world to get online and help look at satellite images to help map archaeological sites. Um, for us, you know, the core belief of this was openness and transparency. So we wanted people to see what archaeological sites we're finding, where are we finding them, um, how many people are using it, and we set up an expedition. Uh, we collaborated with diverse groups. So this is my good friend, Dr. Larry Coben of the Sustainable Preservation Initiative. Um, so it's an organization in Peru that teaches women that live on or next to archaeological sites uh, business skills. So they are able to create handicrafts and help sell them to tourists to become financially independent. So again, it's not just about the past and what we're finding using technologies. These are communities that are still living and thriving today around the world. These are Inca, these are Chimu, these are people who are so deeply connected to the past. The past isn't past, it is still with us today. Um, that is a huge myth that, that, that um, I want you to understand. And that's, to me, why archaeology is so important, because it shows us that all of these traditions, all of these belief systems, you know, in so many places, in so many ways, are still alive and still with us today and still practice. We have to honor them. We have to respect them. So of course you you'd create your um, uh, your password. We have we had different levels, so we made it a game. Um, I'm not an online gamer, but but apparently it was a lot like an online gaming experience. You started with mapping looting of archaeological sites, then you moved to mapping modern development and then discovery. Um, so this is what looting looks like. And by the way, looting looks the same everywhere. Uh, we gave instructional videos. So of course we started in Peru. We wanted to start in Peru because it's such a well-known archaeological area, and there are so many um, amazing archaeological things to find. And this is what the platform looks like. So when you log onto the platform, by the way, our, our platform is down right now because we're rebuilding it. We're going to India next, more in a couple minutes. Uh, but you see a roughly 200 by 200 meter in size image, which is what we see when we process the satellite data. And you just mark there's looting or there's no looting. You can always revisit the tutorial. It shows you where you are. It shows you um, you vote on it. And by the way, in case any of you have wonder, like, well, wait a minute, if you're showing us where there's looting or where there's archaeological sites, maybe the sites are going to be looted. Maybe looters can visit, visit them. And I should say we have no specific location information right there. You can't click on here and then go to Google Earth and know where you are. Um, there's no GPS information. The only GPS information about the sites um, are, it's, it's on our back end. In other words, we're the only ones that ever have that information. It's only ever shared directly with authorities in those countries. We're able to uh, see a lot of, of amazing archeological features. So this is one Inca fort, so dating to about 3000 years ago that our platform helped to find. We had lots of instructional videos via collaborative effort with National Geographic. So um, through, um, then I need to update this actually. So through a couple of years ago, but now this is even more, we've had over a hundred thousand users who've looked at probably close to 20 million satellite images. They have found over almost 30,000, what we're calling anthropogenic features, so potential archeological features, and over 700 of them are considered to be major archeological sites and features as confirmed by experts. We've had uh, users from almost all over the world. Uh, I think we're, we're over hundred countries, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, a couple, a couple countries left, but I'm sure we'll get there in the end. And what we did is we shared this data with a user, with um, uh, authorities from the uh, government of Peru, so from the, the Ministry of Culture, and they then used the data to help map new Nazca lines. So in other words, the data that we use isn't just about the world helping to map sites. It's about giving tools to local archaeologists to then go out and do what they do best. And I should say, our users range from five to almost over 100. We had people of every age, that, that use this platform. So when we relaunch and go to India, which is what we're working on building right now, so hopefully we'll be relaunching later this year, 
We were supposed to launch last year, but with the pandemic, we had some delays. But if you go to globalexplorer.org, uh, you'll be able to sign up and get information uh, for when we when we launch. We're so excited. We have an agreement with the Ministry of Culture. Uh, we're collaborating with the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, and I'm so excited about what we'll be building um, for, for the future. So ultimately, you know, we want um, our cultural heritage to be shared. We want it to, to you know, to, un to be understood by everybody. And ultimately, we want it to help inform global decision making because all the challenges, all the problems we're facing right now as a world with you know, climate change, with disease, with um, difficult conversations we're having around migration, with um, uh, economic issues. These are all issues we've faced for thousands of years. And they're not going away anytime soon. And I firmly believe that by understanding the past um, and by learning from the past, it's going to help us to create a better future in 2040 and beyond. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will look forward to your questions. Okay, so, all right, so do I, um, I guess you'll, you'll, be, you'll be moderating the questions. Yeah, so um, I'm Steve Vavers. I'm the vice president of the board of Roy Chapman Andrews. And um, so I think Will and I both will be fielding some questions that we've gotten in from the chat, Dr. Parkak. And one of them that we've had a, two questions about is about a practical one is cost. Uh, how much do these expeditions cost and, and how do you get the funding to do the science that you do? So you know, it depends on how many people go. Um, so, you know, archaeological projects in Egypt will range um, in, in cost. Um, you know, some projects only go out with a couple of people, you know, and are there for a few weeks. So you have to buy plane tickets and pay for um, hotel and food and you have to pay your staff. So costs can range from, you know, five to ten thousand dollars excuse me, all the way up to fifty thousand dollars. Right. If you have a big project with a hundred people and you're there for five or six weeks. I mean, you've got to pay your local workforce well, and that's where most of your money ends up going to your local workforce and plane tickets aren't cheap either. So we end up applying for funding from places like National Geographic, the National Science Foundation, and we get a lot of funding from private donors. And I want to share with everyone um, that there's a, there's a really lovely check um, that, uh, that the Roy Chapman Andrews Society has, is, is giving me as part of this award and I'm donating 100% of it to support our archeological work in Egypt. That only seems right. To me, so of course I'm very, very, very grateful, especially in a time when so many of my um, local workforce, you know, hasn't been employed. It will go to help to help pay them. So, you know, the, the, things like this are really, really important for the work the work that we do. And we just keep applying, um, we raise a lot of money. It's it's what we spend most of our time doing is is fundraising and applying for grants. You know, every, every archaeologist does this. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, another question for students who may be in middle school or high school planning to go to college, perhaps. What do you recommend if they if they have any interest in archaeology? What sort of courses would you recommend for foundational um, to to sort of spur their interest in this topic? I would say any science course that you can get your hands on. You know, archaeology right now is a field. There's so many things the, the ways it's developing with computer science with you know, machine learning and mapping and modeling and the remote sensing work I do, biology with work that we're doing in DNA, chemistry, the work that we're doing in um, you know, looking at the chemical analyses and, and where things come from, um, physics with, ar with archeological dating. Um, you know, the more of a science background that you can have going into the field, the better off you're going to be. And I would say foreign languages as well. It's essential to speak uh, in languages that are not ours. And it doesn't matter you know, if you wanna study Egypt, you're like, well, I can't take, Arabic in, in high school, it doesn't matter. Take French, take German, take Spanish. Those, those skills that you learn um, whenever you're learning a new foreign language, you know, it opens up those neural pathways and it's going to make learning the next one easier. I took French all through high school and I started learning Arabic in college when I, was, when I went to Egypt. And it's, it's, it's so, so, so important. And of course, ancient Egyptian as well. Take Latin if you can, um, or Greek or whatever's available to you. Um, but definitely I would say science courses and um, uh, and, and language courses, and also lots of courses in English. You know, um, communicating is so important. You know, even, even composing a, a, a tweet is important. Um, you know, how can you, how can you compact all that information into a single tweet? You have to be able to write well. So I would say your English classes end up being a lot more important than you think. Great, so it's not just archeology span courses, it's all those foundational ones too. Correct. 
So we've got an interesting one here. Uh, since Roy Chapman Andrews is credited by, at least for some people, with inspiring Indiana Jones's character, have you ever um, had uh, an art as an archaeologist uh, an Indiana Jones moment? I'm not sure what that means. He had a lot of near-death experiences out in the field. Maybe that's what the question is. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's probably a good idea for some of those stories I can't quite share. Um, but yes, I, I have. And most of my colleagues who work in interesting places have interesting stories um, to share. Uh, you know, anytime, anytime, any, any, I've traveled to, I don't know how many countries at this point, 30 or 40, and I've had some very near, I've had some close scrapes. But aside from that, um, these wondrous moments of kind of great excitement and great discovery, um, sometimes you have them, right? But it's not for what you think. It's not like you find the map room and you go in and there's music playing and the light shines down and you know where the ark is. I, if only. Um, but, you know, sometimes you find an amazing, you know, maybe a, it's a beautiful piece of pot, decorated piece of pottery or if it's a gorgeous amulet and you have this moment where, you know, I, I remember it was my, one of my first uh, my first excavation. Um, I got a quick stop. Huh? Oh, there we go. Sorry, some issues with with, with muting. Um, uh, you know, and, and I remember when I when I discovered this beautiful um, handle, and I looked at it, and there's a thumbprint on it from whoever made the pot. It was clearly a, probably a large man, given the size of the thumbprint. And I just had this moment where I imagined. Who that person was and their life and um, who they were. And to me, I guess that, you know, that moment of being able to imagine the past was so important. So it's not about the gold. It's not about the treasure. It's about being able to imagine who lived thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Another question we've gotten here is, um, how do you see the future of women in archaeology? So, you know, it's changing. If you look at um, a lot of archaeology and anthropology courses and departments across the country, most of the students in the classes, or at least the majority of undergraduate majors, are women. Um, so it's changing. You know, it's harder by the time you get to PhD, to graduate work. Um, women tend to drop out. You know, again, we're having lots of, a lot of difficult conversations going on right now, but, you know, the role, you know, women um, have face a lot of challenges, sexism. Um, uh, you know, they, the, a lot of, especially as women go on in their careers, um, there aren't great support networks in place for women who choose to have kids. You know, and that, and that, by the way, it's not just academia. That's a much bigger, bigger, bigger conversation we're having as a society. Women have been the most adversely affected by the pandemic. Women who are my age, right, who have kids who are under 10, because working at home full time and childcare and homeschooling is impossible. It's impossible. I, I should have written another book by now. I haven't written it. It's okay. It's fine. You can write a book after the pandemic's over. But again, it, you know, it's, it's really, really hard. It's getting easier. You know, we try to make things easier for successive generations. So there are a lot more women now who are in positions of leadership. You know, I speak out quite a bit. It's my, I try to use my platform uh, for good to, to draw people's attention to these issues, to call out bad behavior when I see it, by the way, from men and women. Um, you know, it's my job as a senior scholar to help protect and guide junior scholars. Um, and I think especially women like me who've kind of been through it, um, you know, we try to use our, our power for um, and it will get easier over time, but it's not going to be an easy road and we have a lot of work to do. And it's not just for women, you know, for, for, for women of color, for, for, for black uh, and, and LGBT um, academics, um, for, for, um, for all women of color. Right? This is a huge, huge challenge. And if you look at representation, if you look at percentages of, of, of women and women of color um, in, in roles in academia, you know, it's a fraction of a percent. Of the same roles that are held by white women and white men. So again, we have a long, difficult road ahead of us, but I'm confident, you know, over time we will get there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, one other question, do you ever, kind of a fun one, do you ever, with space travel uh, becoming more popular, do you ever see yourself traveling to space to do what you do? Or are you going to stay on Earth and rely on satellites? Oh man, I got, uh, yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've, I've talked to some of the folks, um, at uh, at these at these kind of, especially Virgin Galactic, a friend of mine ran Virgin Galactic for a while, and I poked him like, "Come on, you know you want to send a space archaeologist to space." Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are some other people in line first, but um, I don't know. Maybe at some point in the next five to ten years, you know, I I I think I could do one of the near Earth orbits. I think that would be pretty pretty awesome. And I don't know. I don't know if I'll get to the moon. Um, uh, you know, I, t I told our son, I said, you know, people in your generation are going to end up going to Mars probably. Maybe, I don't know. I've, I have friends with some astronauts and they have some 
strong opinions about, about that. I don't know that we'll be getting to Mars as fast as we think. Space is hard. Space is really hard. We first need to establish a colony on the moon before we go to Mars. Mars talk is Mars talk. It's a lot of talk. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, you know, it's risky, of course. Uh, but, you know, like everyone, I, I was inspired as a kid by, you know, by all this amazing space travel. So maybe, maybe I'll get to the moon. That would be pretty wild. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Okay, we won't hold you to anything. Uh, and then I'll ask one, one final question and turn it over to Will to see if he has anything else to add. But if there's a single takeaway you'd like students to get from this presentation, what would it be? You know, don't, don't let um, what you think are your limitations define you at all. You know, like I said at the beginning, you know, I'm a, I'm a small town kid. I grew up in a town just like Beloit and I've been all over the world. Um, I didn't come from a particularly wealthy family, by the way. Um, sort of barely middle class. Um, and I worked hard. I studied hard. Um, obviously, I had a lot of help and support along the way. I want to acknowledge the, you know, the great privilege, privileges and opportunities I've had. Um, but also, it's, it's hard work. And so I think through hard work, you know, it doesn't matter what you want to do. Um, you know, study hard. Uh, don't listen to people telling you no, you can't. Take the take the can from the can't and leave the tea behind. Uh, that's what that's what I tell people. You know, just it's hard work and per perseverance, and you will get there. Um, and you know, and 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 that the look look and, and I think that that's one of the lessons the past teaches us, right? The people in the past were such hard workers. They persevered through the most difficult of situations, through climates changing, through great transitions in power, through economic challenges, and. And look, we're, we're, we exist as a result of their perseverance and their creativity. And I hope that that has helped to inspire some of you, you today. Thank you very much. And Will, any other comments from your end or questions you have? Nope, there's nothing more from my end. Um, I think uh, other than thanking everyone for uh, joining in and just to remind everyone that the uh, um, uh, there's a second lecture this evening. Um, the, the Zoom link uh, will start at 6, and the event will start at 6.30. So uh, please uh, go to our website to uh, follow the link uh, to that event. So uh, thank you, everyone. Do you have anything, Greg? I don't think so. So uh, thank you all, and, uh, and we'll sign off. Thank you all so much. All right, thank you.